Okay, so today we're going to be going over acute pancreatitis and chronic pancreatitis. It's from the NCCPA blueprint for the pants, uh, going over the GI section, which is 9% of the pants. These are two pretty important topics. Acute pancreatitis does have a little bit more involved with it, and there's a little bit more to know, so we'll start with that. So as far as what causes acute pancreatitis is there's, in within the pancreas, there's cells called the acenar cells. The acenar cells are what res are responsible for the exocrine function of the pancreas. They store, synthesize, secrete digestive enzymes. So if these cells get injured, whatever the cause, gall, uh, whether it's gallstones, alcohol use, um, medications, if they get injured, they can actually release these um, digestive enzymes within the cells, which leads to the digestion of the cells themselves. They're not able to excrete these enzymes in the the, they get damaged in a way that they can't excrete these enzymes and they break down and digest the cells, which leads to auto digestion of the pancreas. So what are some of the causes of this injury to these acenar cells? Well, your most common cause of acute pancreatitis by far is going to be gallstones. That's 40 to 70% of the cases. So definitely know this one. It's really important for real life for the pants. Gallstones are huge. So what happens is, is you get these gallstones that come down the common bile duct. And at a certain point, the pancreatic duct meets up with the with the, uh, with the common bile duct. So if you get a, a stone that's lodged right in the little V here, the bile can actually back up and back up into the pancreatic duct. Once it backs up into the pancreatic duct, it causes injury to these acenar cells, which leads to that autodigestion and the failure of these cells. So that's how gallstones causes it. Your second most common cause right behind gallstones is alcohol use. So alcohol use because when alcohol is metabolism, metabolized by these acenar cells, it actually causes these toxic byproducts, which breaks down these cells and causes the same type of problem. So some other causes can be from medications, hydrochlorothiazide, protease inhibitors. Remember protease inhibitors are your HIV medications like uh, ritonavir, Exenatide, if you remember from our diabetes lecture, exenatide, GLP-1 agonist, that's your gooey laundry pod, that's the mnemonic I went over before, if you didn't watch that, it'd be confusing, but exenatide is a GLP-1 agonist for diabetes, it can cause acute pancreatitis, valproic acids is another one, and then there's a really uh, good mnemonic to remember all of the causes of acute pancreatitis, so I'm going to go over that now, really all you need to know is gallstones, alcohol, maybe a couple of these medications. But if you want to get fancy and know all of them, this is a way to remember it. It's called I Get Smashed. So if you think about I Get Smashed, like smashed like isn't drunk, um, that makes you think of one of the causes of acute pancreatitis. And then you can go down each one. So I Get Smashed. So idiopathic is one cause. Gallstones, ETOH, which is your alcohol. Those are your two most common. Trauma, steroids, mumps, malignancy autoimmune, scorpion sting, which is interesting that that can cause acute pancreatitis, hypertriglyceridemia, which not that common because your triglycerides actually have to be above a thousand in most cases to cause acute pancreatitis, but it can happen. Hypercalcemia, ERCP, so it can be iatrogenic, so it can be caused from an ERCP, and then drugs, which is some of the ones we went over before. So that's just a, a way to remember uh, acute pancreatitis causes if you want to remember all of them for the for the board's so moving on um, to as uh, the presentation of these patients. So the presentation is is generally um, pretty standard, and a lot of these patients present the same way. And it's going to be this epigastric pain that radiates to the back. The pain sometimes will be described as boring pain. Now, boring not as in not interesting. Boring in medical terminology means this sharp, stabbing, deep pain, like deep within the body. So like boring an object, a sharp object into the body. So that's what boring pain uh, means. And a lot of times you'll hear that describing an acute pancreatitis patient. So remember that. So epigastric pain radiating to the back and then boring pain. Another thing to note with a pain that patients uh, see with acute pancreatitis is that it changes with position. So it's going to be worse when they're laying supine, but better when they're leaning forward in the fetal position. Even standing up will improve the symptoms, but laying supine will make it um, the worst. And a lot of times you'll see these patients in the fetal position, knees kind of tucked up into the chest just to make them feel a little bit better and improve the pain. You also may have nausea, vomiting, fever, and that's pretty much how these patients are going to present. Now, there's a couple of things on physical exam that you should know as well that are pretty important. A couple of these key terms that the boards like to use, and there's a couple of things. There's the colon sign and their gray turner sign. So what both of these signs are from, or what these are actually for, is it's a sign of abdominal wall hemorrhage. So something inside the abdomen is bleeding. So you have this abdominal wall hemorrhage. It doesn't necessarily have to be acute pancreatitis. In fact, Thomas Colon, who was the doctor who invented the term uh, colon sign, actually initially 
um, founded this term when he was um, when he saw a patient who had a ruptured ectopic and he saw a colon sign. So it doesn't have to be acute pancreatitis, but as far as the boards are concerned, you should definitely think of acute pancreatitis when you see colons or great turnus. So colons there's an abdominal wall hemorrhage and you're going to see ecchymosis around the umbilicus. So this is a picture so you can see what that looks like. So that's colon sign. That's going to be ecchymosis around the umbilicus. And then Gray Turner sign is going to be the same thing, ecchymosis, but you're going to see it at the flank. So you can see it on the sides here. Now, these signs aren't very common in patients with acute pancreatitis. In fact, it's normally seen in less than 1%. But if you do see it, these patients are uh, very severe cases and obviously they have a, a really high mortality rate. So and then moving on to the um, the uh, some other diagnosis, looking at labs. Now, the most important labs you can get for an acute pancreatitis patient is going to be your amylase and your lipase. Now, these are going to be elevated sometimes three times the upper limit of normal in an acute pancreatitis patient. And of these two, the more important or the better lab to get is lipase. So why? Lipase isn't necessarily more sensitive or specific, but lipase stays elevated for up to 14 days where amylase only stays elevate, elevated for about five so if you have a patient with a late presentation coming in it's already been a few days your amylase may go back to normal but the lipase is going to stay elevated for sometimes up to 14 days so lipase is going to be your better of the two labs and then something else that you may see another presenting lab in a patient with this is hypocalcemia so why do you see hypocalcemia well what happens is they can form they're called calcium soaps and as the pancreas gets damaged, you have this necrotic fat around the pancreas, and this necrotic fat actually acts as a magnet for free calcium in the serum, and, it's, and it sucks up all this free calcium, and it forms these calcium soaps. So you're taking away all the free calcium in the body, um, and it's getting attracted to this necrotic fat, which can lead to hypocalcemia. So that's another lab finding you may see in acute pancreatitis patient. Something else you may see is increased ALT, sometimes three times the upper limit of normal. And if you see increased ALT, this is going to be more indicative of gallstone pancreatitis. So remember that as well. That's pretty important. So those are your labs. What are some imaging studies that you can do? So by far the best imaging study you can do for acute pancreatitis is a CT. So CT is going to be your first line. This is going to be your best imaging for acute pancreatitis. But there's a couple other things you can do as well. You can do an ultrasound, but ultrasound's more going to be to see if there's any gallstones. Um, you're going to check the bile duct patency, see if there's any dilation of the, uh, the, biliary, the biliary tract, the bile ducts, and things like that. And then also, really not the best imaging, but you can get x-ray. And the reason I want to go over x-ray is because a couple of the findings on abdominal x-ray has those key terms that the boards like to use. So with abdominal x-ray, if you get an x-ray in somebody with acute pancreatitis, you may see something called a sentinel loop. So this is an ileus, which is like a paralysis of the small bowel from nearby inflammation from the pancreas. This doesn't have to be only from acute pancreatitis, but again, it's one of those key terms that they like to use that's uh, more indicative of acute pancreatitis. So this is what that looks like. You kind of see a loop of bowel here around the area of the pancreas that uh, has all this, this gas trapped in it that's paralyzed, that's not moving along all of the air and everything like that. So that's what a sentinel loop looks like. And then another sign that you may see on an abdominal x-ray is something called a colon cutoff. And this is going to be an abrupt termination of gas pattern in the colon. If you look at this x-ray, you can see where the two arrows are. So you see the gas flowing freely across the transverse, the transverse colon. And then right at the splenic flexure there, you just see this abrupt cutoff. And the bowel is actually decompressed past this point. And this can be something else that also points to acute pancreatitis on x-ray. So those are a couple of the imaging findings that you might see um, in an x-ray. All right, so now you have all of these labs, you have all of these, these x-rays, CAT scans, all the imaging that you did. Now, how do you go ahead and make the diagnosis of acute pancreatitis? So there's a couple criteria that I think is important to know. The first one is Atlanta criteria. In Atlanta criteria, there's you need two out of the three to make the diagnosis. So the first criteria from Atlanta criteria to diagnose acute pancreatitis is that you need an increase in serum amylase or lipase three times the upper limit of normal. So that's pretty straightforward. That's one of your important labs that you're definitely going to get anyways. And number two is just epigastric pain consistent with acute pancreatitis. So obviously this isn't going to be somebody with left lower quadrant pain. That's not going to be consistent with acute pancreatitis. But if you have epigastric pains radiating to the back describing as that boring pain that piercing deep pain or if they're saying the pain is worse when they're laying down but it's better when they're sitting forward that's descriptive of acute pancreatitis so if you get these first two 
you're done. You have your criteria met for acute pancreatitis, you can go ahead and diagnose it. But if you only have one out of the two, you go ahead and do your imaging, and then you're going to have uh, either your CAT scan, your ultrasound, something that's consistent with acute pancreatitis. So like on CAT scan, you may see something known as pancreatic fat stranding. Sometimes you'll see inflammatory tissue surrounding the pancreas. So something consistent with acute pancreatitis. You need two out of the three. That criteria is pretty important to know. One other criteria that I do want to mention, I don't know how much time you should really spend memorizing this because I feel like maybe you'll get one question, but maybe not. And I just don't think it's that important, but I do want to at least go over it so you have some idea. So it's called Ranson's criteria. And Ranson's criteria has a couple different ways that it's broken down. So Ranson's criteria, you can base it off of the admission, their labs on admission, and then after 48 hours. Overall, this is determining the severity and the overall mortality rate of Ranson's criteria. I'm not even going to go over the 48-hour criteria because it is way too extensive, and I do not think you should waste your time on it. If you want to kind of memorize or at least be familiar with the admission criteria, I think that one's more important. And the questions that I do remember seeing in school and things like that was based more on the admission criteria. That's a little bit more important. So let's go over the admission criteria. So three or more, this is going to indicate severe pancreatitis, high mortality rate. Two or less, not as severe, obviously a lower mortality rate. So the first criteria, you need three of these for severe. It's going to be a glucose over 200, age over 55, um, LDH over 350, AST over 250, and then a white blood cell count over 16,000. So three of these to indicate severe pancreatitis. And then the 48-hour criteria is based off of um, oxygen saturation, um, sequestration of fluid, calcium, BUN. It's much more complicated. Don't even worry about it. It's not worth the time. So those are the two criteria I think you should at least be familiar with. Now, moving on to treatment. So treatment is not very complicated. It's really just supportive care. Most patients with acute pancreatitis are going to get better. You just want to make them comfortable in the meantime. So you really want to rest the pancreas. It's supportive. So how do you rest the pancreas? Well, you give these patients IV fluids. You make sure that they're NPO. That's the important thing. You also want to treat their pain as well. And I just want to address a common misconception with pain relief with acute pancreatitis. It was commonly um, stated that mepardine, or also known as Demerol, was the number one medication for acute pancreatitis. And why do people think that? Well, the thought was that the Demerol or mepardine didn't increase the sphincter of ODI pressure. It didn't uh, cause vasospasms in the sphincter of ODI. That's what it was originally thought, and a lot of people still believe this, but if you look up at up to date, it's no longer the case, and they've realized that almost all of the opioids, including mepardine, can cause vasospasm, can cause increased sphincter of ODI pressure. So really, the, the top medications that are used in acute pancreatitis are fentanyl, hydromorphone, um, morphine. You can really use anything. There's not much of a difference, but don't believe the mepardine hype. It's really not true, and it's not um, at all based on any studies that were found. So that's kind of obsolete. If you do hear that, you should you read the up-to-date material. So pain control, you can use really any of the, uh, the opioids is fine. But the main thing with acute pancreatitis, just remember NPO, IV fluids, those are the main things that you need to know as far as treatment. So nothing really too intense with treatment that you need to know for acute pancreatitis. So let's move on to uh, chronic pancreatitis. Not as much to know here. It's a little bit more simple. Um, so chronic pancreatitis really results from some kind of continual injury to the pancreas. So chronic inflammation, that's going to lead to this calcification. And uh, basically, it's going to lead to the loss of both exocrine and endocrine function. So you're going to lose your, your insulin and your digestive enzymes. And it can result from multiple episodes of acute pancreatitis. No. Now, what are some of the etiologies? Now, remember, in acute pancreatitis, gallstones was your number one. Alcohol use was your number two. But gallstones, by far, in acute pancreatitis is your top. Now, chronic pancreatitis is a little different. In this case, alcohol is going to be 70% of your cases. Alcohol, by far, biggest cause of chronic pancreatitis. It's the one you need to know. Gallstones are not um, a very big cause here of chronic pancreatitis. So don't really, you need to remember that chronic pancreatitis is alcohol. And that's the big one here. It may also be idiopathic causes. Sometimes it can be caused by trauma, but by far and away, alcohol, chronic pancreatitis, most common cause. So that's the one you really should, really should know. The other ones are not very specific and there's not really any reason to know really anything but alcohol. That's your main cause of chronic pancreatitis. So how is this patient going to present? There's a famous triad for chronic pancreatitis. Now, just because this, this triad is pretty popular doesn't mean that 
it's seen in all of your patients. In fact, in chronic pancreatitis, this triad is only present in about a third of uh, the patients, that all three. So only about a third of patients present with all three of these. So what the, the triad is, is pancreatic calcifications, steatorrhea, and diabetes mellitus. So steatorrhea is going to be this um, inability of the body to break down the fat, because remember, you're losing your excrement function, of the pancreas, so these enzymes aren't going to be produced that break down the fat, and this is going to lead to um, this oily, fatty stools that are going to float, and that's what steatorrhea is, these fatty, oily stools due to the decreased excrement function in the body. Now, the pancreatic calcifications are a sign of uh, chronic inflammation, and that's what um, results in this this breakdown of the pancreas and the loss of your exocrine and endocrine function and then finally diabetes mellitus remember you're losing both endocrine and exocrine so your endocrine function is going to be your your insulin production so that's why your these patients present with diabetes mellitus so this is a really important triad to know but remember in real life only about a third of your patients are actually going to present with all of three of these so some other symptoms that you may see of course, just like an acute pancreatitis, you have your epigastric pain radiating to the back. Some patients are actually going to be asymptomatic, and you may find this. It may be an incidental finding. You get an x-ray and you see all this uh, calcifications on the pancreas. So not every patient is going to have um, symptoms, and they may be asymptomatic. So that's important to know as well. So now, when you want to diagnose chronic pancreatitis, this isn't very straightforward. And in fact, establishing a diagnosis with chronic pancreatitis can be really challenging. There's no diagnostic criteria that's um, universally accepted. You know, unlike acute pancreatitis, where we have that Atlanta criteria, Ransom's criteria, there's not a universally accepted criteria for chronic pancreatitis. So it's really just a combination of, you know, the patient presentation, a lot of the, you know, the symptoms that they have, diagnostic findings, but nothing really specific, meaning that there's not a lot that can be tested on for the, for the pants here, your URs, your boards, um, or your other exams. So as far as the diagnosis, um, amylase and lipase are actually normally going to be uh, normal usually going to be normal in these patients. So advanced disease may be decreased, but generally this is really not diagno diagnostic, not a very important tool, amylase and lipase, as in it was with acute pancreatitis. So as far as some of your, your imaging studies, on CAT scan and x-ray, you may see a calcified pancreas. You may see ductal dilation on the CT. So those are some things that you may see on your imaging. And then one of the more important tests, one of the more useful tests is actually going to be pancreatic function testing. And there's something called fecal elastase. So elastase is, is an enzyme that's made in the pancreas. And this test measures the amount of elastase in the stool. So a normal finding is going to be anywhere from about two to 500. Anything less is going to indicate a pancreatic insufficiency and kind of point, to, point towards uh, chronic pancreatitis. Now, as far as treatment, again, not really specific here. You're really treating a number of different things. They have problems with the exocrine and endocrine functions. So you want to treat all of that. But if there's one thing as far as treatment with chronic pancreatitis that you need to know for your patients, it's to discontinue all alcohol use. They cannot drink anymore. This is going to make it much worse and progress much faster. So they really need to discontinue alcohol use. And if any intervention is um, most successful, this would be it. So that's your most important one. And then as far as the other things, you're really just going to be treating all of the things that are now deficient. So you can give them pancreatic enzyme replacement. This is something called uh, pancreolipase, uh, lipase, also known as creon. And this is a combination of lipase, protease, amylase, all the things that are deficient in the pancreas now because of the loss of excrement function. So you can give them that. It's, uh, the brand name is known as Creon. And then also pain control, uh, low-fat diet is important because remember, they're not producing those enzymes to break down the fat. So you want to limit their, their, uh, their fat and their diet. You can also give them vitamin replacement. And then in severe patients or patients that you really want to control the pain, you can actually do enteral feeding, like a feeding tube, to bypass that system and to help them break down some of the food. And that's in your more severe cases. So as far as treatment, there's a lot of different things. It's kind of a wide variety of things that you need to treat these patients with chronic pancreatitis. And those are the main things you need to know. But most important, of course, discontinue alcohol use. So those are That's really all that you need to know for uh, acute and chronic pancreatitis. Again, thank you. I appreciate you guys uh, leaving me comments, reviews, letting me know how this is helping. And as always, good luck on your pants, your EORs, your panry, and good luck in PA school.